Hey guys, I've recently seen a lot of newcomers to the VR world of DCS, and I noticed some of the frustrations I've had to overcome popping up all over the place. I've been asked countless times to post my settings, and generally this doesn't help people because the graphics settings for VR can change your frames per second much more drastically than a monitor, and it's much more dependent on the hardware you have. So most of the time I just try to explain those settings and what they should change for the best performance for their hardware. Now while there's a lot of good places to look, and a lot of posts here and there, I thought it might be better to create a hopefully short comprehensive guide to what I've learned over the past year and what I try to explain to people new to VR. I've been playing DCS pretty much strictly in VR for just over a year now. I play way too much. <laughs> So I've come to learn a few things along the way. I also, at about the same time I started playing DCS, took up streaming. And so I've been doing that for about a year or so now as well. Now, since I started playing DCS in VR, a lot has changed. And my taste for the game has changed as well. I currently really only like playing 2.1, mostly because of how gorgeous everything looks. I do pop into 1.5 from time to time, but as for right now, 2.1 is where it's at for me. Now, 2.1 comes with its own restrictions. It does require a bit more horsepower, especially for VR, but I'm willing to pay for this because of the immersion. So for this guide, I will be using 2.1 as a reference. Basically anything I show you here, you can do the same in 1.5. However, trees and grass settings seem to take the biggest toll, so adjust those first before anything else. For this video, I want to cover three things. Graphic settings, along with their impact on immersion and performance. VR zoom, this is a topic on its own, simply because I still find to this day people have been playing in VR for months and had no idea they could use this feature. And lastly, recording and streaming in VR, and how I set up my scene and capture at the same quality you see from other content creators using Track IR. So first, let's take a look at my system specs for reference. Now, while you're watching this, please keep my specs in in mind. If you're lacking any or all of these, your results may vary. Now let's take a look at the settings I use. Remember, this is all for 2.1 and these are the settings that work best for me. I play strictly multiplayer and with these settings I can maintain about 45 frames per second or more in most situations. Now I know some of you who use VR are going to see this and wonder why with my system specs I run lower settings than you. Well, this is because of multiplayer. There's a bit of extra overhead for the netcode stack and significant decrease in frames because it runs on the same thread as the render stack. Also, I stream and record most of my gameplay, so that costs me anywhere from 3 to 9% of my CPU. So let's take a quick look at each of these settings individually, and I'll try to explain what each one does and where your priorities should be when tuning your settings to achieve peak performance and quality. So first is textures. This setting is the aircrafts you see and other various vehicles. These are also textures you see in the cockpit in VR. I leave this on high because if I don't, the textures in the cockpit are pretty much unreadable. So my suggestion is this is one of your highest priorities. Next we have terrain textures. This one's pretty subjective. Personally, I do all of my flying at a relatively high altitude and such the terrain quality doesn't really matter to me. However, I found that my system can handle it on high and with minimal impact, so I keep this one here. If you're struggling to gain a few extra frames, I would definitely turn this one down. Civilian traffic. This setting I leave off. I generally play a combative role of some sort, and this is a digital combat simulator, and I'm pretty sure you wouldn't see John Smith driving his Honda Accord to work in the middle of a war zone, so this one just seems pretty silly. However, I know that some of you like to do aerobatics and, you know, go for a joy flight here and there, so this setting is going to be left to your discretion, and it doesn't really have too much performance impact on 2.1. Water. The way I understand it, a low setting simply adds the diffuse color along with some lighting. Medium adds refraction, which is what you see under the water, and high adds the reflection, which is everything reflected off of the surface of the water. With 1.5, this meant that you had to render the scene separately for under the water and the reflection to textures, and then when you actually render the water, you use those textures to add the reflection and refraction. With 2.1, it's my understanding that deferred rendering reuses the rendered scene for both, so 2.1 does offer some sort of performance increase because it doesn't have to do everything separately. So there's quite a bit of difference. If you can afford it, I would turn this setting on. 
visibility range. Now, this is a topic of discussion for a lot of people. This does seem to affect the distance at which you see buildings, trees, roads, and other various static objects. I've looked at the Lua code for this setting, and while it seems to affect the range at which you see enemy units, those values are really high already, and the settings for Ultra and Extreme are not much higher. So the difference between them is really only noticeable with static structures. And in VR, objects at a far distance seem to get clobbered by the screen door effect anyway, so I don't see any reason for using Ultra and Extreme as the performance impact is pretty high. Heat Blur. This is simple. I just need it to sort of work. It looks good enough for me, and I'm guessing the effect on high just means a higher resolution texture, and that detail is not going to be noticeable in VR. Shadows. This is a tough one. I will admit that medium shadows don't look all that great, but this setting seems to have a high performance impact going from medium to high. So for VR, the next three options, resolution, aspect ratio, and monitors, they don't apply. Let's move on to resolution of cockpit displays. This is something I've tried on many different settings, but to me, the only setting that makes sense is 1024. Now you're probably asking why not 1024 every frame? Well this is simple. 1024 is good enough. Putting it on every frame in areas with lots of detail can cause a pretty significant amount of frame loss outside of the texture itself. And I would rather the TGP or cockpit display be a little bit more laggy than my visual reference outside of the cockpit. MSAA. Simply put, this is off. I see a lot of complaints in this area. Things like, I can't stand the shimmer or the shimmer, 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 whatever. I play multiplayer. I play competitively, and shimmer is the last of my worries. If I'm going to lose frames because I want my cockpit to have less shimmer while I die because I'm frame loss, it feels pretty stupid to me. So for me, MSAA is just off. Depth of field. This setting's pointless for VR. I don't even know if it works. I've never even turned it on. Um, it looks great for screenshots, and that's fine if that's what you're going to take, but you might as well do that on desktop anyway. Lens effect. Personally, I just like the flare. I don't really care for the dirt and there's no real performance loss that I can see here, so I'll leave this one up to you. HDR. This setting is handled by deferred shading for me. If you play with deferred shading off, I suggest you turn this on for the immersion, otherwise everything doesn't really get that luminance and the vibrance it should. Deferred shading. I feel like this is a must. If your machine can handle the deferred shading, you gotta turn it on. The HUDs in all the aircraft are pretty much fixed. I think the only one at the time of this video that doesn't really have a good fix is the Mirage. I'm sure that'll come, but immersion-wise, this lighting system looks fantastic. If you can afford the performance hit, this should be on. Grass and clutter. This one's subjective. I don't really care. Yeah, it looks great on the ground, but you're taking off most of the time, so who cares? It makes very little difference to me. I leave it relatively low just so I have something when I'm on the ground, but even then, if I had to turn it off, I, I just don't even care. Tree visibility. This one is also subjective. I play mostly on Nevada right now. Because of this, there's not really any trees. Once 2.5 hits, I'll probably reevaluate this setting, and based on the performance improvements of the tree rendering in Normandy, I'm guessing you could leave this one at around 10,000 or so. Again, this is this is one of those settings that's going to be different from person to person based on specs, but some's better than none, I suppose. This is a tough one. Preload radius. If you have the memory to support this, roughly about 16 gigs or more, I suggest you turn it on. My understanding of this setting is that it preloads information that it's going to need to render things on the map or the map itself into memory. As you move distances, it has less to load because it's already preloaded. If you can support it, why not? Chimney smoke density. Outside of seeing the direction that the wind is moving, this effect looks pretty dull to me. The smoke moves at exactly the same direction, there's no variance of any kind, and the effect is pretty lackluster. So my thought in this is keep it as low as possible, why let it affect your frames when the difference, it needs some work in my opinion. Gamma, this is 100% up to you. I prefer something between 1.5 and 1.8 depending on the scene and the time of day, but I'll leave this one to you. There's no impact on performance, it is always used, and I believe it's always used when using deferred shading, so this one you can figure out on your own. Anisotropic filtering. Now this setting has been in 3D games since I've played 3D games, and this setting affects the blurriness of the texture based on the distance from the camera. So at a low setting, textures at a distance have a much more blurry look to them than they do on a higher setting, and it's mostly noticeable on things that are moving away from you, so something like the lines on a taxiway or, or the lines on a runway, and I don't really see much difference in performance loss, so I leave this one all the way on. Terrain object shadows. For the immersion, this is a must. If you can at least keep this on flat, you're doing better than nothing. For the performance, this one's also a problem, so it's a real toss-up on whether you want to use this or not. 
It affects not only the textures on the ground, but also the shadows on the terrain. So if you're having frame issues, I suggest turning this off first and testing your frames to see if it gets any better. And if it doesn't, leave it back on. At least try flat. This one's going to take some tuning on your part. Cockpit Global Illumination. This setting seems to cast a diffuse reflection from the sun off of the terrain below the aircraft and in the cockpit. The effect is really cool for external textures, but in the cockpit itself, my complaint is that it's too strong, especially at altitude. So I leave this off. Disable Aero Interface, V-Syncs, Full Screen, Scale UI, these are all off for me. And last but not least is Pixel Density. I run mine at 1.5. I do this for spotting purposes. The higher the setting, the more blurry a 1 or 2 pixel target is going to be on the horizon, and it causes them to be much less visible in VR. We facehuggers already have to deal with spotting issues caused by the screen door effect, and depending on your device, it can be a lot more drastic issue. As an example, here's the screen door effect shown on the Vive on the left, and on the right is the Oculus. You can see the individual pixels are visible and at times can be distracting. And as objects get further away, they become much more distorted. Blurring those objects at a distance can make them much more hard to make out. Additionally, for most people, anything over 1.8 does not cause much of a noticeable quality difference because of the screen door effect, especially for the cost and performance. Okay, let's quickly talk about VR zoom. As some of you are aware, the default field of view zoom found when playing on a monitor doesn't exist. You can bind the zoom access all you want, it doesn't do anything in VR. There is, however, a separate setting in a slightly odd place in adjusting the controls menu within DCS. So here's how you get there. You go to Adjust Controls section in the in-game options and click the top left drop-down. Select UI Layer. Here you will find two options for VR. Recenter VR View and VR Zoom. VR Zoom can be bound to your HOTUS and it works as a press and hold binding. Meaning to zoom, you press the button and when you release it, you're done zooming. I will say this zoom feature takes some time to get used to, especially if you're prone to VR sickness. So keep that in mind when you're trying this out. Okay. So let's talk about streaming and recording in VR. If you're new to this, I suggest OBS. It's free, easy-ish to use, and as of late seems to be pretty stable. You can use things like Shadowplay if you want to do some simple recording without overlays and additional scene components. But OBS can use the same NVIDIA encoder Shadowplay uses, and with added functionality of being able to stream and record from the same piece of software, this is what I use. So you have a couple decisions when setting up to record VR. You can show a full portrait picture, so you you don't cut off the top and the bottom of the view, or you can zoom in and center the frame so you get more of a 16 by 9 view uh, for your users. And this will, of course, cut off about 40% of the view. Personally, I prefer the second option. This gives a view more like track IR, and this is what people are used to seeing. The trade-off obviously being that you're zoomed in and thus exposing bigger pixels when recording. However, if you have an NVIDIA card, you can overcome this by doing a few things. If you have a monitor with less than 4K resolution, we can have our graphics card use a custom 4K resolution that will downsample to your native monitor resolution. Now, I don't have an ATI card, so I can't tell you if this is an option for ATI. Maybe somebody else can make a video on how to do this. However, for NVIDIA, here's the steps to do this. First, let's open the NVIDIA control panel and go to Change Resolution. Then click the Customize button. Check Enable Resolutions Not Exposed by This Display. Click Create Custom Resolution. Enter 3840 for horizontal pixels and 2160 for vertical pixels. Click Test. Then select the newly created resolution. Click OK to accept. Next, we need to start DCS. Once started, make sure you have a pixel density of 1.4 or above. This will make the DCS VR mirror stretch the entire height of the new 4K resolution. Now, I want to note, I have found zero performance impact. This trick does not render anything differently. It just allows the mirror to be a higher resolution, therefore giving you a higher fidelity picture in OBS. Now, let's move over to OBS so I can show you how to set up a scene. So with OBS open, go ahead and go to settings, go to video, change the base canvas resolution to 1920 by 1080 or 2560 by 1440. I use 2560 by 1440 because I also record for YouTube videos and I downsample my stream to 1080p. Go to output, change output mode to advanced, make sure the streaming tab is selected, set encoder to NVENC H.264. This is the shadow play encoder. Check rescale output and set the drop down to your desired output resolution for your stream. 
For streaming, you should be at 1080p or 720p. The rest of the stream setup will be to fine tune based on your bandwidth and what you think is acceptable for your stream quality. So you're gonna have to play with this yourself. Now click on the recording tab, set up the preferred recording path, set up the preferred recording format, set the encoder again to NVNC H.264, and that's it. Now we're ready to set up the scene. From the initial OBS screen, on the bottom left, you will see two square boxes. The left one is your scenes, and the right one is the items you have in the selected scene. So first, let's create a new scene. Click the plus button on the bottom left of the leftmost section. Name your scene to something like DCS VR scene and click OK. Now select the new scene and click the plus button on the bottom of the box on the right. Select Game Capture and name it something like DCS VR Game Capture. Click OK. Now I prefer to use the exact process I want to capture rather than whatever's full screen or in focus. And this is to protect me from basically accidentally showing something that I shouldn't show on stream. Make sure DCS is started. Click the drop down for mode and select capture specific window. Click the drop down for window and select DCS. Click OK. Now you should see the game capture replicated in OBS. Drag the window all the way to the left of the canvas area so that it snaps to the left side. Grab the anchor on the right and snap it all the way to the right side of the canvas area. Now, to center the view, press Control D. And that's it. You should now be able to stream in uh, much higher quality than 1080p. Hopefully, this guide helps you get set up with not only the appropriate graphic settings and VR setup, but if you were looking to record or stream in VR as well. If you like this and would like to see more content like this in the future, go ahead and hit the subscribe button to get notified of future content, and I'll catch you guys next time.